I didn't know what channel I would follow to carry out this idea of cultural administration. But uh, it was very simple. I didn't have enough talent to do any one thing superbly well. Uh, I couldn't draw. I wasn't that musical, although I've sung all my life in choruses. Uh, I wasn't that good an actor. I uh, <clears throat> didn't do math and didn't do uh, the visual expression that it would take to be an architect, although I loved architecture. And um, I wasn't going to be a poet. And I wanted to achieve. So I figured the solution is to combine something so you can get a niche that other people haven't got. So I would go into the arts from an academic point of view, and I'd combine that with a business school degree. And then I could market myself as a kind of cultural administrator, a kind of midwife for culture, and someone to arc the uh, connection between uh, an audience and a work of art or the arts. And so that was uh, a career objective that I carved out for myself uh, as a kid. I was driving from the station in Washington uh, home to Georgetown. My father was working in the government, and I think I must have been 12 years old. I remember it was raining. We passed the National Gallery, and it was uh, that wonderful pink marble, and the rain gets very rich rose. And I remember looking up and saying to my parents, that's the kind of job I would like to have someday. Now, little did I know that I would actually be director of that museum. But I felt that um, institutions had the stability to bring the arts to people. And um, perhaps art museums were the most stable because theater companies come and go, and there's a lot of risk in the various performing arts, and it's sort of ephemeral. But there's something wonderfully permanent about those collections in art museums. And then you can use that as a base to bring in other art forms. We had performing arts at the National Gallery. We have our own orchestra, one of the only museums that does. We have free concerts every week. And uh, we would bring dance groups in to relate to our monk show or whatever. And then we had outreach. And so our education system went out, reached, my day, 80 million people a year. And so out of this institution, one had a kind of base. And that seem to make sense. They took me in spite of that. Maybe they thought they could convert me. But since then, I understand that up to 20% of a business school class at Harvard are interested in the not-for-profit sector. Uh, so there's been a tremendous sea change, because they accept women, too, and that's helped. Uh, they didn't in my day. And they don't let you do what I did, is come bang off from Harvard. Uh, you have to have worked. And I would have gotten more out of the business school if I had worked before I went there. But I had a lot of more education that I had in mind in, in history of art. I did not major in the history of art as an undergraduate. And that was on purpose, on the advice of a hero of mine, the uh, former director of the Metropolitan Museum, Francis Henry Taylor, who was just one of the most charismatic people. And I went to see him and ask his advice about preparing for a museum career. So he said, well, first of all, don't major in fine arts. I said, what? He said, you'll be doing that for the rest of your life. You'll have to go to graduate school. You'll be deep into it. Get a broad cultural background so that uh, what you do after that all has meaning. And so I majored in history and literature, which uh, Harvard offered to a small percentage of the class and which was a wonderful field. And I took some art history courses, but very little. I really got my art history aboard later. Oh, it changed my life. Uh, basically being uh, in a position where you don't take anything for granted anymore. You have to sort of understand the rationale of what it is to be an American. And then culturally, Europe, you know, every few feet there is some extraordinary uh, visual or cultural experience. And uh, uh, my mentor, Francis Taylor, said, you got to go to Europe 
and wash your eyeballs in the stuff. And it's true. I mean, he had this great phrase. He said, a museum is a gymnasium for the eye. And uh, one, you know, the stuff he said that's in America has been filtered through dealers. It's only what's movable, what's uh, uh, fashionable at the time. In Europe, you get things that are painted on the walls and are going to move. And you've really got to expose yourself uh, to that. And now, of course, we have this global outlook. It's important to go to Asia and to see. No one will understand a Japanese garden until you walk through one and you hear the crunch underfoot and you smell it and you experience it over time. I mean, you know, there's no photograph or any movie that can give you that experience. Timing is really everything. When I got to be director, I got into the files and I saw that if I had gone through with my plan to get my doctorate, um, and wouldn't have been available to be hired as a lowly assistant to the director at the gallery at that time, and then groomed to be director very quickly. Um, my then boss had had a, another person all lined up. And uh, the ifs of history, these are the roads not taken. If I just said, no, I'm sorry, I, I'm not available for a year, that would have been the end of a National Gallery opportunity. So um, it is useful to be where the lightning is coming down at a given moment. And um, uh, I credit a lot of what's called success to just um, serendipity. I was immensely prepared. I was 11 years in studying after getting out of high school. Uh, I had a year in Europe studying with Bernard Berenson and traveling and learning German and guided the Louvre Museum School, and later the Hague uh, Art History Bureau. And uh, uh, I had both the business school and this very rigorous master's at NYU Institute of Fine Arts of this Germanic thoroughness, two and a half years with a full blown thesis, and comprehensive exams in the whole history of art, and two language exams. And uh, so, yes, and I'd had this fabulous opportunity growing up exposure. But uh, I'm interested in the inscription that is carved apparently over the lintel, the entrance of the institute founded uh, by Fleming, the uh, discoverer of penicillin. Fortune smiles on those prepared to receive it. And uh, you know, the Bermuda race and yacht racing is such, my father called it the Great Atlantic Lottery because uh, where the Gulf Stream is and what the weather is is uh, so fraught with uh, uh, accidental uh, eventualities. And yet, when we were doing it, Carlton Mitchell won it three years in a row. And uh, so, you know, there must be more to it than just luck. Talking of ocean racing, one of the best lessons I learned was the concept of the rum line, R-H-U-M-B. And you lay down a course, Newport to Bermuda, and that's your rum line. And then for some reason, you get blown off course. And a lot of people make the mistake of saying, oh, we got to get back to the rum line. There's a new rum line. It's from where you are to where you're going. And it's so important to be able to pick up and forget all that and say, OK, play it where it lays. This is the new situation. I've gone on, uh, stayed on my other, under my other hat as chairman of the Fine Arts Commission. And uh, boy, did we get it at the time of the Vietnam Memorial. I mean, I had Ross Perot in my uh, office pounding the table. I was. Uh, I knew that he sent in uh, operatives to Iran. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Uh, he wanted it his way. And uh, there was uh, great brouhaha about that. Now we have brouhaha about the World War II memorial. And uh, as of just a couple of days ago, that's all been ripped open again. And we've got to go through more of these hearings where a small dissident group has gin ginned up a lot of uh, uh, complaint. 
And basically, it's a resistance to change. It is, there's a nostalgia about the way things were. Everybody thinks they were always that way. They forget that the mall is a 20th century concept. And uh, the Jefferson Memorial also had people lying down in front of bulldozers, but it was built in 1941. And uh, we have added and changed the mall continuously. And this is only going to enhance the great design of the vista between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. And yet, people just want to keep everything the way it is. And uh, fine, sometimes it's better the way it is. Uh, but we feel that this little fine arts commission, which are chosen to have some kind of credentials in the visual world, has a lot of experience in visualizing what something's going to be. And we think it's going to be OK. Well, I had a fabulous opportunity of having two parents who each was very interested in the arts. My mother, particularly in music, she'd been a music critic before marriage. She played in the Johns Hopkins Orchestra and the violin. My father took up the cello, and we had chamber music uh, during my childhood and on. I mean, they were passionate about making music. They also had record collections. My father collected. Uh, orchestral works, and my mother collected opera. And when they merged their two collections, there was hardly a single overlap. Uh, my father was very visual. And he was into uh, collecting drawings. He was into architecture. He had a drafting board in his study all his life, into the history of architecture. He'd been a patron of architecture, both uh, Gothic Chapel at St. George's, which he worked very closely with Ralph Adams Cram, and then later, a very pioneering building. In 1936, he hired Richard Neutra, a revolutionary modernist, to build the first modern house of any size and importance in the East. And uh, <clears throat> so I grew up in the summers in that house, and it had a big effect on me. But one absorbed through the pores a sense of the arts from this wonderful atmosphere. And there was travel, and they could take us to museums, and they really knew what they were looking at. So uh, it was a pretty exciting way to grow up. Well, I was a passionate sailor. I uh, just loved everything about messing about in boats. I loved racing, because it's such an intellectual challenge as well as a physical challenge. You have to know about nature and weather and uh, the f physics of it, and a psychological challenge, because it's what your opponent is thinking and what you think he or she's going to do. And so that was a great passion. But uh, I'd um, been very lucky to be sent off to school. A lot of people don't think it's so lucky. Boarding school at 9. I went to the Arizona Desert School in Tucson where we all had our own horses. We learned camping. We played polo. We had the most wonderful life because it was so beautiful. We'd get up and do chores at dawn and see these incredible Arizona sunrises. The tough part was that because they didn't have air conditioning and it gets so hot, the season, the academic year was squeezed. So you didn't start till mid-October and you got out early May which meant there was only room for one vacation in the middle of the year, which meant we were there at Christmas. When you're nine years old, you're away from home at Christmas. It's a little bit of a strain. But um, I think that's maturing. And I loved being in the outdoors and being in that gorgeous uh, natural environment. I mean, the desert is as beautiful as anything that exists. And I go back. I was there just a few weeks ago out of nostalgia. I just love it doesn't exist anymore. It burned down. And I had a Proustian experience at one point by renting a horse and going out and seeing if I could find any archaeological <laughs> remains. And finally, I did some tile that didn't burn in the fire that burned it down. And uh, I could get it fixed back in my memory as to exactly where I was between 9 and 12. And then I went to school in Massachusetts. They couldn't believe that any school way out there could prepare you. But I only lasted two weeks in the grade they put me in, and they bumped me up. And I was five years there. And um, that was pretty uh, uh, challenging, uh, because one got a darn good education. And, uh, <clears throat> but I had trouble with my knee. I had to give up football. 
I became manager of the football team. It gave me time to practice the piano, and then I learned I was never going to be a pianist. So it was, uh, it was an exciting time uh, from every point of view except socially. Oh, I was hopeless. I was very unathletic. And uh, when I was in school, I was two years younger than everybody in my class. So I got beaten up all the time, and I got laughed at for being interested in studying and doing stupid things like that. And uh, it's been so rewarding. I'm going to my 50th anniversary of my high school. Uh, and uh, it's so rewarding that now they feel I'm the guy that sort of made it out of the class, having been the class joke. Uh, never completely joke, because I was president of the dramatic society, and I did manage to graduate first in my class, but that wasn't the value system of that particular group of boys. They had an undefeated football season, they were really good at athletics, and the atmosphere in school was pretty anti-intellectual in those days. We had a wonderful history teacher at school, and uh, uh, <clears throat> that sense of enough too little and too much about, you know, these great generalizations about why some civilizations made it, and the others where it was too hot or too cold, and uh, some great concepts that were pretty challenging. And then uh, there was no art history taught, but uh, I did run across a book of uh, Flemish painting, and I sort of turned the pages and really fell in love with that. And then I had a fabulous opportunity, which was to take a gap year in England, because my parents said, you know, you're pretty young to go to college. Why don't you just do something else? And um, Stowe School was the perfect place to go because it was fairly recent compared to some of those hidebound English schools. So to come in in the top, it was OK not having been through the whole system. And uh, it was set in the most gorgeous country house in Britain. I mean, there's the South Front by the Brothers Adam, the original by Vanbrugh, and these great architects, and one of the fabulous parks, the Capability Brown design, the revolution in landscape architecture. And this whole concept of these houses as vessels of civilization uh, really gets to you. You absorb it through the pores. And uh, I had a wonderful experience being out of my own country and understanding you've got to be answering all the questions everybody says. Anything that happens in America, you're responsible. And I think it's the most broadening thing you can do. My daughter just has had a fabulous time by having a year in France as a junior high school, and it's changed her life. She's just completely opened up. And um, I highly recommend to people to get time out of their own country. It just makes all the difference. Then I came back, and uh, Harvard offered me to skip freshman year, and I said, that wasn't the point. <laughs> and so then when I was in uh, and closer range to my uh, classmates, I was a happy camper. And God, I found that it wasn't so oddball to like music and poetry and the visual arts. And there were kindred spirits there. I was in dramatics. I was president of the Harvard Glee Club, which was the nearest thing to a professional organization as an undergraduate. We sang as the chosen chorus in those days of the Boston Symphony. We toured. We sang in Carnegie Hall. We recorded with RCA and won the grand prize uh, for our Berlioz. Uh, uh, sang all the great literature, the Bach B minor and the Passions and Beethoven. I mean, it was a fabulous opportunity. Three rehearsals a week, 50 concerts a year. And then the final summer, a European tour, which was the first time since right after World War I that they'd done it. So we were embraced with open arms by the Europeans. And we sang for the Pope in St. Peter's and uh, in Royal Albert Hall and uh, in the <clears throat> music festival in Holland and in Berlin over the radio. And, uh, that was very rewarding to be there with a purpose, not just rubbernecking, but we really felt needed. And, uh, doing something for America and for Harvard and also for ourselves. I managed to get a summa from Harvard. That was kind of exciting to be up there on that stage with eight other people uh, representing the whole class. And uh, there wasn't grade creep in those days. So that, uh, But again, so much as luck, I got uh, a wonderful teacher who put me onto a manuscript 
Well, really not. It's, it's a text, but there's only one copy in the world, which is in the treasure room of the National Library in Paris, of a poet who had been overlooked by generations of French who got into classicism. And this guy was a shaggy, baroque poet, rather like the uh, uh, <clears throat> British at the, at the time. And uh, um, so it was fun to do an undergraduate thesis that really was breaking new ground in scholarship. And, uh, um, that was uh, very rewarding. Well, a succession of teachers, obviously. Uh, I think most of all, my father, sort of my hero, uh, just an extraordinary human being, a great range and great gentleness. And uh, uh, my mother was pretty spectacular too. But um, professionally, people like um, Kenneth Clark. Lord Clark, as he became, who did that civilization television series. When we showed that at the National Gallery, we caused a stampede. I mean, there were traffic jams down Constitution Avenue. We had to show it every, uh, uh, as soon as we got through the 13-point series, we had to show it over again. You know, people wouldn't, and we gave the National Gallery medal to Lord Clark, and the day he came, uh, we recognized that we couldn't uh, go through the original plan or just have him appear on stage, that uh, people, so many people had showed up in the morning, in the middle of the week, that went the whole length of the West Building inside the National Gallery. And so I brought him in at the far end. And as people recognized that he was coming in, they began standing up. So there was this wave and this clatter of the seats scraping against the marble. And by the time he got to the stage, he was in tears. He, he writes about it in his autobiography. He said he was terrified. But it shows that people do get interested in culture if it's presented to them right. I feel it's important to keep the viewer in mind and not to just top down Alita say, well, here it is, and if you don't understand it, that's your problem. Uh, on the other hand, it also can be made fun. And in exhibitions, I brought my passion for theater in a little bit because um, normally a permanent collection does not occupy the dimension of time, and I think it shouldn't. People can go any place and see anything at any moment. But an art exhibition, which is only there for a while, gives one an opportunity to offer the viewer an experience that is linear over time, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so I had a lot of fun with the exhibitions at the National Gallery working with this wonderfully talented team of designers and curators and uh, producing a kind of show out of it that uh, would leave people changed. And uh, uh, that was a lot of fun. It was also a lot of work because you had to get people to lend. But that could be fun, too. There's a lot of travel involved and a lot of jawboning and a lot of disappointments. Um, Doris Duke had a pillow which said, the answer is maybe, and that's final. <laughs> and that was the story of my life, borrowing art objects. They just uh, would never commit one way or another. It was the perils of Pauline over and over again. But uh, it uh, made the adrenaline flow. Well, there is a kind of conservatism in uh, the museum world, or used to be. Um, uh, in France, the word for curator and for conservative is the same word. <laughs> and uh, people like to do things the way they always were done. And um, that's where my Harvard Business School training came in. One of the first things I did when I became director was get rid of the desk that my predecessor had had, which was this huge big desk with a high back chair and this little rickety uh, chair uh, by the side where anyone who came to see him would come and sit straight up, uh, sort of like a surf, uh, handling his cap. And uh, <clears throat> I got rid of all that. I got the pay office to design a totally modernist interior, even when we were still in the West Building, and substituted a round table with five equal chairs that were swivel chairs. And um, what it telegraphed was that we were all there equally to solve 
the problem, whatever it was, which was somewhere in the middle of the table. And uh, everybody could contribute, and everybody, by the end of it, should buy in. And um, this was just a very different management style, but it seemed to work. One regret I had was that I'd always been intrigued uh, about the opportunity to direct a play. I'd been in a whole bunch of plays and I'd never directed one. And I made a decision early on at Harvard that drama took too much time, it was open-ended, and I could do the glee club and there was a schedule and I could plan it, do my studies too. And then I helped found a theater group that was uh, central staging. And the first play was Richard II, which is one of my favorites. And they asked me to direct it. And the week before, I had been elected president of the Glee Club, and I felt, I can't do both. And I've often looked back and thought, you know, if I had directed that, because I had all kinds of ideas of how to do it, and it had been a success, and I'd gotten turned on, that could have been a life-changing experience, and I could have gone into that field. And so the road not taken, I mean, you know, what Churchill called the ifs of history, it's uh, um, always gnawed at me, it would have been interesting to do. Directing a play is one thing, or I did get a chance to direct a movie. And uh, actually, my boss at that time was so worried that I was really into that, that uh, he was afraid I was going to change careers. Um, <clears throat> The um, gallery got some money to do, an, do a film on its American collection. The gallery got some money to do a film on its American collection. And uh, they hired somebody to do a script, and the director didn't like the script. So I went around to the filmmaker and said, if anonymously I do a script, if you submit it and it flies, then I get to be the writer, right? So I said, great. So <laughs> my boss calls me in and said, hey, this is a big improvement. I, who, who wrote that? <laughs> well, I had to confess. So once I'd written it, then it was ridiculous not to direct it. And uh, I had a ball, and we shot it in 35. We got Burgess Meredith to narrate it. Here I was in Hollywood driving in a convertible with these big uh, uh, polygonal ICC cases behind and uh, sunglasses, and I thought, oh, boy. Uh, and so my boss pulled me back and said, no more movies, <laughs> we're going to keep you in the museum profession. <laughs> oh, lots, you know, you get somebody that would be just perfect as chief curator, is a major professor at a university, and uh, he comes down, house hunts, it's all locked up, and then at the very last minute, he says, you know, I really can't do this. I, I love teaching too much. I can't leave my students. And uh, it's just, you know, a blow in the pit of your stomach. You go all the way, start all over again. And uh, uh, it, uh, it takes a little picking yourself up off the floor, that kind of rejection, and uh, starting again. Funnily enough, not. I don't know why. That doesn't seem to be in my chemistry. I'm just a sunny personality that has this idea that everything's going to come out all right. Um, when I was diagnosed with cancer uh, this, uh, just this last year, um, I figured, OK, well, that's what apparently is in the deck that I've been dealt, and uh, we'll just do the best we can. Um, don't let it. Don't let it put you into a slough of despond. Uh, one thing I f really fear is living too long and becoming one of these vegetables and a burden to everybody and to yourself. And so I've had such a rich life, such fabulous opportunities that I feel, OK, take it as it comes. I feel so strongly that if we possibly can, we should be doing something for our fellow humans while we're here in this short span. And because I've had the opportunity to find personally how immensely rewarding it is to plug in, 
to the riches of our cultural heritage and to all of the arts, I want to share that with people. I feel not to just theoretically bottle it up and enjoy it myself. I feel a kind of evangelical impulse to say, hey, look what you're missing. You can get so much more out of your life if you just give a little bit of yourself to understand and tune into this fabulous material. I have a very biased view of the relative importance of um, culture and things like just making money. Um, I was very disappointed when I had dinner with an undergraduate who, uh, at Harvard a couple weeks ago who said that over 50% of his class, he thinks, are just absolutely tunnel vision about how they can max out their income. And uh, I just feel that is a kind of corrosive of aspect of American society that is doing us in. Um, it's the result of the consumerism that is driven by this massive assault of advertising, uh, by the gold rush mentality of the dot-com era, get rich quick, stock options, and so forth, which uh, I think it's fortunate for this country that some of the bloom has been off that peach. But it distorts the values. It makes people aggressive and competitive, and uh, uh, they have no time for their families, for really mining the riches that are out there uh, that could enrich their lives. And so I hope that our education system can begin to deflect more attention to exposing the young to the arts and to culture and to their heritage so that then we develop a uh, demand side to culture that will make the whole thing happen. They will become the electorate. They will become the uh, patrons by virtue of being the consumers of art. Uh, if some of them also are producers, that's great, but that's a very small minority. And if we can get the value system of the society turned toward that direction, we will have a much happier nation. This is not a happy nation these days. Uh, Bob Hughes's culture of complaint is right on the target. Everybody wants to be a victim or uh, complains about being a victim. Fractionation into these uh, uh, identity politics subgroups has lost sight of the a pluribus unum idealism of our founding fathers. That's why I feel so strongly about this World War II memorial. That was our finest hour. This country pulled together and took care of one of the greatest evils that has ever beset this planet. And uh, it was so exciting. I was alive then. And you know, from uh, farms to factories to the front lines, everybody was focused on one thing. And now we're spoiled. Um, Younger people have all of this affluence, and uh, they get into uh, uh, drug culture. They get uh, uh, <clears throat> feeling that the world owes them. And uh, I think it's too bad. Uh, I think that uh, we can do better. A peak experience from the arts. Uh, being in a concert hall or in front of a great painting or a work of architecture and getting that buzz and that shiver down your spine. Uh, retrospectively, I guess my greatest sense of satisfaction is <clears throat> the East Building of the National Gallery. Again, luck and timing, I was there when we had this extraordinary donor and Paul Mellon and helped uh, choose an extraordinary architect, I am Pei, with whom I worked for 10 years on this project. And to have it voted by the rank and file of the American Institute of Architects as one of the 10 best American buildings of all time uh, is rather satisfying. 
And uh, people have voted with their feet. They come in there, you watch them as they enter the building, and you watch that jaw drop. And uh, they put their finger on the name of the architect that's carved in the wall. We can't now get the oils out. We just leave it. And uh, people uh, are enriched by uh, what goes on there and by the experience of being there. And um, so that does give one a certain sense of satisfaction of being a small part. I was uh, one of a whole number of people who made that happen. But uh, uh, luckily, I was part of it. Well, the Academy has that little list, and that's about the best list I've ever seen, you know, from vision and perseverance to integrity. Uh, it's hard to think of anything else. Um, a lot of it is hard work, you know. Uh, it, uh, there are trade-offs to that, but uh, you have to put in the hours. Um, but um, a lot of it is being sensitive to other people and um, uh, there are more ways of skinning a cat than rubbing its fur the wrong way. And there's no point breaking a lot of crockery unnecessarily. I think everybody has a bent. And the key is to follow that bent. Uh, so much human wastage comes from people who are doing things with their lives that they really aren't happy with. And to recognize that it doesn't have to be a financial success to be living the most productive and rewarding kind of life. Uh, if that is your bent, go to it. It must be great fun to be a tycoon. But not everybody has that gift. And I see so many people struggling away in law firms or at brokerage houses and not really happy, waiting for the weekend when they can get out and tinker or do what they really want to do. So do what you really want to do. That's why God put you on this earth. I am so proud of being an American. I happen to have had a lot of forebears who also took advantage of the American dream starting in 1630s and uh, we're able to uh, take advantage of the system and make uh, very rewarding business decisions. But to me, it has to do with a freedom for self-realization and uh, that we don't have to be coerced. We have this extraordinary affluent society, fabulous resources. And uh, one should feel that America can offer opportunity to people who really put in and not simply take.